We're coming to you live from the Hyatt Regency Hotel, and the reason we're here, get your game on the 33rd Annual Caribbean Conference of Accountants, Building and Innovating Caribbean Businesses. Our first guest, as I indicated earlier this morning, is none other than Ryan Pinda. Mr. Pinda, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well, thanks. And welcome to Trinidad for this exciting event. Is this the first time that you're speaking at this event? I spoke at this event a couple of years ago as the minister. Now, you know, and I, when I did the introduction, I did say that you're a former Minister mm -hmm. of Finance to Bahamas. In terms of the agenda, a very, very heavy agenda yeah. uh, over the next couple of days, what are some of the things that you will be addressing uh, as you speak to, to the attendants? Well, I speak this morning, and I'm going to speak um, on a panel that addresses the state of affairs of the industry, really of the Caribbean as a whole, and uh, are we prepared to move forward? Uh, where do we see changes? Where do we see evolution? Um, and then what can we do to prepare ourselves? As you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the industry in general, the finance industry, but in general, the services industry of the region has been uh, you know, challenged and, and in certain instances publicly plagued uh, with, with a shame game. And then how do we prepare ourselves to deal with these changes and how do we prepare ourselves to, um, to move forward? When you say where we see ourselves now, where mm -hmm. do you see the Caribbean region? Yeah. Well, I think we're, we have to undergo significant economic reform uh, in the region. I think you are seeing um, countries look to go external trade. We're looking for the finance industry get international pressure. We're looking at tax reform. We're looking at um, economic reform. Uh, and then where do we place accountants? Where's their role in it? And how do they have to evolve to meet the challenges of a, a changing economy? Now, the role of an accountant, the role of a chartered mm -hmm. accountant, the yeah. role of an auditor, people lump it all in the same category. And when right. things go really bad, they yeah. say blame the accountants blame the and accountants. check the auditors. <laughs> Why was it not picked up before? That's right. uh, you know, how do we then address the misconceptions mm -hmm. but ensure that there is compliance as it relates to these three important rules? Right. And, and everybody kind of blends the, the accountants <laughs> together. And, um, you, you have distinct roles. Yeah. I mean, you have uh, client advisors who are accountants. You have auditors who are accountants, as you mentioned. And I think it's very important. Um, you mentioned the word compliance, and, and compliance is becoming uh, very important. You let up in your introduction. Are we overly regulated? Are we underregulated? Do we comply too much? And uh, I think it's a major function of where we have to go when you look at changing economies. I'll give you an example. In the Bahamas, our financial industry, we are now looking at an explosion in the fund industry, where traditionally that's been Cayman or other right. jurisdictions. In the last two and a half years, we've had 100% growth in funds in the Bahamas. Well, now that's a new role for auditors. Now they have to know how to audit funds and funds from different jurisdictions and different countries. And how do we have the professionals in small countries? Uh, certainly the Bahamas is smaller than Trinidad, but Trinidad is also a small country in relative size. How do we have our professionals keep up to the changing demands uh, of the industry? Um, we have different regulation, tax reform. For instance, we just put in a value-added tax in the Bahamas. Now our accountants are going to have to look at the books of the companies and make sure they're complying and fill out the returns. Are they properly educated? Are they properly prepared for these changes? Uh, and I think a, a forum like today, uh, where you have over 700 participants from around the Caribbean is a great forum to be able to highlight these changes. Now, you know, when you look at compliance and over compliance, and you talk about the state of the Caribbean economies, uh, there is the extreme example, and we have the cases like in Clico, where yeah. regulation was lax. So you, you have to get that breathing space. So let's give the company the time, to, the opportunity and the space to grow mm -hmm. for the directors, and let's just tell them, well, put your, your oversight committees. But in the Caribbean, it, it, we don't really have the regulation, the regulating body. We more depend on moral suasion. Is it about time that we move away from that? Well, I think um, what you look to do is you try to evaluate it on what we call a risk-based approach. You put more regulation and boxes around the high-risk businesses, the low-risk businesses. You give them a little bit more flexibility to do business. The problem is in small countries, everybody knows each other. Um, you know, that's my cousin running that business, that's my schoolmate running that business, and I'm the regulator. And, and so how do I take an objective position? A and those are difficult challenges in small countries. And, and the smaller the country, the greater the challenge. Um, and, and so you need, really need as independent and robust a regulator as you can, on, away from the pressures of politics, away from the pressures of governance. And who's responsible for that regulation? Uh, do you think it should be self-regulated? Do you think that we should put stringent measures to ensure this compliance? And then mm -hmm. when we do that, 
you have the extreme where people are saying, oh God, you're stifling our opportunities for growth. Yeah, I mean, it's always a difficult balance. And the problem we have as small countries is it only takes one real negative, uh, one real um, conflict to be able to take down an entire industry. Uh, you mentioned Clico. I mean, the, 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 the region is still reeling from the activities uh, of Clico. Uh, the Bahamas still hasn't come to a proper solution in how we're going to compensate our policyholders in Clico. Uh, and this is a decade old or more. And, you know, and that's interesting yeah. that you point that out because uh, I don't think people realize when we think Clico, because Lawrence Dupree was uh, Trinidad and Tobago yep. born, uh, we think it's a Trinidad problem, but nope. it's a regional problem Absolutely. that spans that spans throughout the globe. And it's mm -hmm. interesting that you see uh, looking at a situation like that, which sort of had a ripple effect throughout That's the right. Caribbean, mm -hmm. that the Bahamas has yet to ascertain the if, uh, an effective formula. Yeah, because, you know, the Bahamas uh, piece of Clico now is in liquidation. Sometimes we get over-legalistic in these things. Our liquidation of Clico has been going on for over 10 years. Um, partly because the assets you can't dispose of, and, and, and that's a problem. And now you look to governments to step in, um, like they've done elsewhere in the region, and, and take that burden on, uh, something we're going to have to force to, to do in the Bahamas. But you look at that through um, the banking industry. Look at the proliferation, for instance, of the Canadian banks in the Bahamas, uh, who are, or in the, in the region, who are now pulling out, who are now uh, realigning, and, and what is that effect? In, in the region. We have had an inability to have a true diversification from our banking system and now when the Canadian banks don't want to be in the region, the whole financial system can collapse. That would be my other question because we do have a very in particular, the ca Canadian footprint is extremely, mm -hmm. yep. uh, in terms of the presence here, can be felt throughout the Certainly. region. And now that they are realigning, now that they are rationalizing their operations globally, mm -hmm. our indigenous banking system, you just have about two or three actual success yep. stories. In Trinidad alone, you probably just yep. have first citizens uh, being recognized uh, beyond Trinidad and Tobago shores right. without any, any alliance. So when these international banks start rationalizing and pulling out, what does it mean for our financial sector? Well, I think you need, in order for a region to be successful, a certain capacity. And having isolated independent banks through the region uh, doesn't, I don't think, give the proper capacity for when a multinational, like the Canadian banks, pull out. Uh, I really think you need to see either informal or formal alliances amongst the, internet, the independent banks through the region to be able to give it some credibility, uh, some substance, um, to be able to, to, to be a backstop when the multinational banks pull out. Um, having an, kind of an isolationist approach is going to be very difficult, uh, I think, in, for the financial system of the region. Uh, Mr. Penny, do you think that uh, we should be worried about all of the international institutions pulling out? I think we should. Um, I think we should. When you have such a dominance um, of institutions throughout the region that support the financial industry, um, I think it's a risk. And when you have them all coming from one country, uh, I think you, you, you get a little bit of follow the leader. So if you see one bank realigning, it's not too far after the next bank from that same, same country is going to realign. Um, and, and it's a challenge. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's something that, as a region, we have to look at. At the, at the uh, CARICOM heads of government meeting that was in the Bahamas uh, this year, um, the Caribbean Bankers Association wrote a personal letter to, to our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Christie, who was the chair of CARICOM heads, uh, saying that there's a challenge amongst independent banks in the region for getting correspondent banking relationships, being able to do uh, transactions in foreign currency um, because of the risk nature that multinational companies look in the, into the region. And I think that's in part a function that we have independent standalones in the different countries without the capacity. Um, and if you bring them together um, as a regional bank from per se, even if it's an informal alliance, uh, I think you develop that capacity and the risks um, really come down. So it is a real risk. I think the financial system in the region uh, are having real challenges um, and that they need to come together kind of as one uh, uh, to address these kind of types of challenges. Now looking at the types of challenges, and I know that earlier we spoke about the CLECO matter and looking at what you are still facing, yeah. uh, you know, internationally in the U.S., they still didn't even get it right. Uh, yep. The big U.S. of A in terms of the bailouts, and even after that, uh, mm -hmm. directors and major shareholders yep. were being paid large sums of monies. What do you think are some of the lessons that we've learned, and what are the issues still plaguing us post Clico? Well, I, I think part of the issues um, that are plaguing us as a region 
uh, are really human capacity issues. I mean, in order to meet these challenges, uh, and everything is changing day by day in the financial industry, but in every industry, um, things, are, things are changing, things are globalized, global regulation is there, and how do we ensure that we have the capacity within our respective countries, uh, especially the smaller countries, to meet these changes and meet these, these demands? I'm sure it's no different uh, in Trinidad than the Bahamas. You have a concern about having too many international people in the country versus employment of your people. You know, in the Bahamas, we're at 16 percent unemployment, and we have to address that issue. Um, but we have to question whether the people are properly prepared to take the jobs. Um, and, and I think that's a regional challenge. I think we don't have the capacity um, to meet some of these regulatory aspects that are being put in place. When I was the minister um, and we, were, we had a lot of uh, regional meetings at CARICOM, we always discussed matters such as uh, FATCA and how, how are we going to, to, to approach FATCA, which is the U.S. regulation right. for exchange of information, when none of our people really understand the U.S. tax system or, 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 or countries like the Bahamas, any tax system, because we don't have income yeah, tax. Um, and, and, and so where do we get the capacity from? And that was always a burning question amongst political leaders is we have to react to the world. We have to react to the regulation that is being imposed upon us. Um, but as small countries, do we really have the capacity um, to put our people in the forefront to ensure that the compliance is done properly and we don't have any missteps going forward? Missteps going forward. You know, during my introduction, I also spoke of uh, the international investigation yep. scandal that has uh, involved a number of Caribbean personalities and Caribbean jurisdictions. Certainly. They've been identified of places of interest and yep. persons of interest, and that's yep. uh, in the indictment uh, statement that has been released by the U.S. authorities. How, in terms of the reputation and the bloat of financial sector, I know that, I believe in Cayman or the Bahamas, one of the senior banking persons came out and said, we are casualties of this investigation. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're, you, the, the region is, are casualties of this investigation. When you have a, a multi-country global banking system in, in your country and you're doing almost exclusively international transactions, um, the ability to, to, to properly police and, and, and ensure proper compliance is in place to address any um, untoward activities is very difficult. Um, the Bahamas has been implicated um, through one of its banks. Cayman has been implicated through one of its banks. You know, certainly we have a number of other countries. Uh, Trinidad has Trinidad. three banks, that yeah. four actually that have been listed. Yeah. So I mean, it, it is it is a a, a serious. Uh, serious blow and and we look at other um, scandals the Petrobras scandal in Brazil has touched banking institutions in Cayman Islands for instance and so this is something that that is present daily um, through different jurisdictions and I, I think we have Are we to... more susceptible to these things as opposed to other jurisdictions? Well I think we're more susceptible because we are more uh, a lot of our countries are more concentrated in the financial system um, over 30 percent of our GDP in the Bahamas is, is in the financial services directly or indirectly so so clearly we are, we are a, a jurisdiction that is used in financial transactions and today um, almost every crime um, requires a bank uh, you cannot commit a crime without a bank these days so I think the, we, with a growing um, concentration of, of financial um, crimes is really going to cause an, a greater exposure for the region for sure, absolutely. You know, when we look at the state of Caribbean economies, uh, for a very long time and a very long period, the Caribbean economies and the banking sector in the Caribbean, the concept of offshore banking, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a, a legacy issue that we're fighting or perception in terms of people. Uh, I know recently uh, from Anguilla, have been, they've been, been identified as hotspots for offshore banking and p potential wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you, ha you have to draw the distinction because you, you have... Um, very legitimate banking activities that are going on in the region, banking activities that are global and international that are used to support global industry. Um, and, and, and that's perfectly legitimate and should be encouraged. And I think that's why you see some of the smaller countries uh, really trying to develop their, their financial services base. I mean, St. Lucia is all over the place as well, trying to develop it, its financial services industry. And I think that's a good thing because, you know, the Bahamas has been, Royal Bank first came to the Bahamas in 1890. Uh, we granted our first offshore bank license in, in 1940s. So we've been in the industry for quite a long time. And the financial services industry is singularly responsible for the middle class in the Bahamas. And so, especially for smaller countries, you really feel the economic impact of the industry. 
Um, we have also done a very well, a good job of committing it to our compliance professionals. We have a, a, a Bahamas Association of Compliance Officers, which I always used to call as the ministers, the gatekeepers of the industry. So you haven't heard a lot of scandals coming out of the Bahamas where, where other financial services jurisdictions you would have. And um, that goes back to the human capacity issue. If you have the ability um, to have the professionals to protect the industry, then you have the ability to have a successful industry outside a scandal. If you have an inability or unwillingness to protect the industry through your people, um, then you're absolutely going to fall into scandal because every single crime, as I said, requires a bank. That is true. The world is changing. Your yeah. closing comments to our audience this morning. I know that you yeah. are addressing uh, the, uh, the attendees this morning. Ryan Pinder, uh -huh. former Minister of Finance of Bahamas and also one of the key speakers this morning, attached to the Deltec International Group. Closing comments. Well, I think that we have to be cognizant of the changing environment around us. We see um, economies through the, through the region stuck in mediocrity. And I think we have to look outside. We have to be more engaged. Um, I had a, a conversation or speaking engagement in London on the way forward for the Caribbean and I made the point that we have to be less intrinsic and more external. We have to be integrated as a region but integrated for external development and that's the only way we're going to get growth and our professionals have to be prepared for that. Our pro professionals have to be trained, they have to be aware of international regulation, international aspects um, and our people have to be prepared to, and our politicians have to be uh, have the political will uh, to reach outside our borders, reach outside our region and try to bring uh, growth to our people. Um, this, this is an era in the next 18 months that's going to be very interesting. There's a number of elections, certainly there's one coming up here. Uh, we'll have an election in the next 18 months in the Bahamas. Um, and, and so with these elections come policy shifts and it'll be interesting to see how that development uh, affects the region. Looking at how these developments affect the region. I'm Hima Ranky soon. This is the Morning Brew. We're coming to you live from the Hyatt Regency Hotel. And the reason that we're here this morning, well, we're talking about the Institute of Chartered Accountants of the Caribbean. They're hosting the 33rd annual a Caribbean Conference of Accounting. Get your game on. You know, I was actually telling Mr. Spinner, well, that's pretty catchy. And everyone <laughs> says accountants are so boring. Well, who would have thought? <laughs> uh, we take a short break. I'll see you after the break.